morning. Welcome to God's house and the beauty of this place. We find Jesus Christ. We pray that that's our spirit of worship here this morning as we come together in his house. After a busy week, a warm week, we welcome those who are visiting with us. We're glad you're here. and We pray that you would experience Christ's presence here as well. Um, Christ invites us into this place with our call to worship. If you turn with me in our bulletins, uh, responsive, and it comes from Psalm 92 and 95. Come, let us sing to Yahweh. Let us come into the divine presence with thanksgiving. It is good to give thanks, O Yahweh. To declare your steadfast love in the morning. And to the music of the lute and harp. For you, O God, have made us glad by your word. That places a spirit of joy and excitement as we come together to worship him this morning. Let's stand and invite each other into God's house this morning with a handshake. Let's turn in our hymnals number 188, 188, 189, there's a couple little, um, maybe little choruses we learned as children, praise him, praise him, all you little children, God is good, God, or God is love, God is love, and then the alleluia, alleluia. And let's sing all the verses of both these uh, two little choruses, 188 and 189.
can turn with me to number 680. 680 all the way, this, my Savior leads me. A theme from Psalm 48, 14, our God will be our guide even to the end. Let's sing the three verses of 680. with me, please. Father, that's our passion, it's our desire, that you would walk with us every step of our life, every heartbeat of our heart. We come, Lord, with that assurance and that reflection on who you are in our lives into your house this morning, Lord, to bring back that offering of praise and gratitude and celebration for walking with us this past week and walking with us in this upcoming week. So, Lord, as we worship you through many different avenues, through singing, through uh, just maybe sitting in silence and hearing you speak to us through your word or giving our uh, petition and thanksgiving before your throne. Lord, may all of it focus and honor you in every part. And so, Lord, we lift our voices together in corporate worship by praying together the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Psalm 91, the psalmist says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Let's dwell. Let's rest in the presence of God through prayer. Let's go to God in a prayer of confession. God who delivers and redeems, we have failed to live into the promise of new life. We have been afraid to enter troubled waters to help the poor and downtrodden. We have sought ease and comfort in exchange for ignoring the hungry and sick in our world. Forgive us when we've seen our faith in such narrowness. 
thinking of only our own salvation. Forgive us when we have not lived for others, when we have not been willing to risk ourselves for the sake of others. Call us into new life, a life that is filled in the promise of your love for the, for the whole world. In Jesus' name, amen. God, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we thank you, O God, that your passion is for the whole world, that you won't return. Jesus Christ will not come back to take his own until every part, every tribe and every tongue of the entire world has heard the good news, the gospel. Father, some years ago that thought was overwhelming. It was like, how can all parts of the world ever hear the gospel? But today, Lord, in a technology world where the word of God goes out in so many different venues and opportunities, it makes us think that possibly it could be getting close to every tribe and tongue hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. Yet you give us one just simple instruction. Don't try to figure it out. Don't waste your time pending on putting together all the prophecies of the Old Testament and therefore coming up with the eschatology of this will happen and that will happen and the children of Israel will be rescued and then Christ will return. You simply say, I don't even know. Only the Father in heaven knows. You just be ready. So part of that readiness, Lord, is coming here this morning and being encouraged by your word. Part of that readiness is coming to you in a time of confession, saying, God, we've messed up. We haven't focused on others like we should have. We've fallen short of uh, helping those who are in need. And therefore, Lord, we, uh, we want to be ready, so wash us clean again, create in us a new heart. And that's our prayer this morning, Lord. As we wait in anticipation, as we wait in readiness, Lord, we also want to prepare our hearts for each day. Each day that brings forth so many opportunities. Opportunities of joy in our life, of celebration, of gratitude, and opportunities of pain, and sorrow, and hurt. All those mixed emotions, Lord, and all those mixed happenings that we read even in the Psalms, Lord, we know that you're present in all of them, but sometimes, Lord, it's really difficult to experience that. Oh, yes, we can talk the Christian game. We can say the right compassionate words. We can even speak the truth. But, Father, to experience it at times. as if we're on a lonely island. Father, looking for someone to help us. And so, Father, we call on you this morning in those times of joy and celebration, even when we think we're steering our own life, I ask, O oh God, that we would understand that you are the one who's created us in your image. You're the one that's created that baby in a mother's womb. And for that, we praise you this morning. We praise you that you bless those who are going through that time of pregnancy. We celebrate again, Lord, this morning with the Wilsons and the birth of their baby girl, Addison May. We thank you, too, that Harper could be in God's house with us this morning. Father, we praise you, Lord, Lord for blessing the Vandenbergs. We think of others, Lord, who have infants in that beautiful sanctuary that you've created. We pray for safety. We pray, Lord, that as it grows into the image you made it, we would see it as the picture of God alone. We thank you too, Lord, that as we go through this life, it tells us it's but a blinking of an eye. But we start out as that uh, infant, and then we move into that toddler stage, and then we take that first step, and we fall down, and we try again, and we fall down, and then we lean on something, and we fall down again. Lord, it's just a picture of our life as we grow. Our spiritual life. We take a step walking with God, and then we maybe waver, and we 
you fall down. You may even get back up and take a couple steps in our spiritual walk and sin grabs us and we fall down. We may even lean on someone. And then we fall down again. Oftentimes, Lord, we're leaning on our own desires. Then we move on to that elementary stage and we start seeing the vigor of walking with you. That stage of youth where we make our own decisions and we're impacted by those around us. We pray, Father, that we as a church here at Grandview would encourage young people, and encourage children. We know the years of most impact are from the ages of three to five will last their whole lifetime. We pray, Lord, for young adults. Kind of that stage where we feel like we're kind of on that island, and yet, Lord, what a powerful witness and testimony young adults can be to the lives of young people and the lives of, of young children having experienced that age. We pray also, Lord, for uh, parents. What a responsibility you placed on our life. In our culture today, Lord, parenting oftentimes is seen as a burden. Children are seen as a mistake, as a burden to carry. Oh, Father, how dreadful. Think that this image you've created is a mistake, but you've made them in your image, and you are no mistake, God. But from the beginning of time, you created us in your likeness. We pray also, Lord, for the elderly. We thank you, Lord, for their foundation that they've set for us as young. We pray, Father, that you would continue to walk with them and bless them as well. We pray for those, Lord, who are in a time of distress, who are wrestling with uh, physical ailments. We pray especially for Roke, that you continue to walk with him. And be with Rex today too, Lord. May he have a Sabbath day blessing. Be with Harold and Leonard. Pray for those two, Lord, who have seen your hand of miracles in their life. We continue to be with Les. We thank you, Lord, for being with him. Be with Ellie and Irwin and Deb, Jim. Father, we rejoice that you've placed people in our lives that can deal with the situations that are amongst our physical body, healing. You can place body parts within our life that can give us true sense of relief from pain. Thank you for being with Gary. We pray you continue to be with Gene. Give him patience for the pain in his hip, Lord. May it subside or may it calm down or may there be relief or may that surgery date be moved up. Father, this is all in your hand. In fact, uh, Psalm 139 says it's been ordained already. So we wait on you. We pray for those who are in a state of loneliness because of the loss of a family member. We ask, O oh Lord, that you'd walk with the Rhinan family, continue to be with Gina and her family as they laid their dad, their husband, to rest in this past week. We father, pray, Father, for this young family that you would give them strength for each day. We also ask, Lord, that as we anticipate the return of Jay and Austin and the 155th, Lord, we wait in just a true sense of excitement and um, maybe we'll understand a little bit this morning what we're going through when we ask you to calm our fears. How will we react? What will be that emotion? What will be that uh, adaption to having a loved one home again after a long period of time of vacancy? So Father, we pray for that transition. Pray, O oh God, that uh, you would be seen in the midst of these relationships. Pray also, Lord, that you would um, walk with this church. Bless us in this upcoming week as we have opportunities, we have schedules, we have uh, uh, just a real time to uh, impact other people in their walk. And I pray, God, that you'd give us strength for that. When we feel weary, Lord, could we truly sense you filling our cup and giving us strength when we're exhausted and wore out? 
We trust you, God, and we trust your word this morning. I pray again, Lord, you'd bless your servant whom you sent, whether here on this pulpit or in the radio waves or in a Bible study or a Sunday school classroom throughout America, throughout this community, throughout this town, throughout this state, throughout this world, that your word would go forth today, not as some passive thought, but with boldness and conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord and God reigns and is still on the throne. And for that we come to you in perfect confidence that you'll minister to us. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's ask God to take our hand, precious Lord, take my hand. 684 will remain seated as we sing all the verses of 684. I invite you this morning to turn to a couple scripture passages. We're going to be in the Old Testament, although I'll be looking in the New Testament a little bit as we as we get going here. But our first scripture reading will be Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Psalm 34, and then we'll look at a few verses in Genesis. If you want to keep your Bibles with you this morning, uh, we'll be looking at Ephesians chapter 6, and 1 John 4 as well, just a few verses in there to give us a little sense of direction here as we look at a uh, sticky topic in fear, fear. Psalm 34, here is David, he's just uh, come out of hiding after Saul's been chasing him, and so Saul's been looking for his head, and so we know a little bit... uh, Maybe the fear that he's feeling. And so these, well, this is what he writes down on paper. I will exalt, extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is a, blessed is a man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive. You have your personal Bibles. I have that underlined. underlined. Attentive to their cry. 
The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers them, him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Even evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. There's powerful verbs in those last five, six verses of what God does for us. He hears us, he delivers us, he's close to us, he saves us. Again, David said he delivers me, he protects me, he redeems me. And if you want to look at that in more in depth at a, at a later time, I love that psalm. Then we look at Genesis 3. Uh, this is the fall of mankind, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, verses 8 through 13. Then the man and his wife, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid. I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I command you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me. She gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Here ends the reading of God's word. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, if I asked you what the most commanded command from God in Scripture is, what do you think that would be? I think many of us, myself, I would say it's a command to love one another. Or maybe we would think the command to be obedient. Not so. It's unique that it's in the Bible 366 times. So one for every day in a leap year, the command that is the most sought after, the most popular command from God, and it's this, fear not. Fear not. I was amazed by that. I was amazed by that, and yet it's not something I don't think I've ever really ministered on, the true thought of fear, because it's a hard one to tackle. Uh, as I sat in my office last night and I started writing down some thoughts and putting together some thoughts, I was really struggling. In fact, I came to a dead end and it was about 11 o'clock, so I went out and bailed for an hour, then I came back in the office a couple hours and uh, got up a few minutes ago, and here we are. And I thought, you know, God, I can write down all this great stuff that I've studied and I've looked and I've read in your word, but it seems like just fluff to me in the eyes of fear. The most popular command and yet probably the most difficult to live out for many of us. Because some of our lists of fears are endless. And so I went to Google and I looked up what does Webster say fear is. And I think he has a pretty good definition. Fear is described as an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that something is likely to cause pain or a threat to your life. So it's a belief in our mind that something's coming down the windpipe that's going to cause pain in my life, that's going to be a threat to my life. And in this action of fear is one main word, and that is we're afraid. We're afraid. We're afraid. And so as I was studying, I saw an acrostic. I thought this would maybe give us some insight. When we spell out the word fear in our lives, uh, this is what it means. False evidence. 
I gotta look at the third word. Appearing. Real. I don't know if I could say it any better. I don't know if we'll find it any better in God's Word. Fear is false evidence appearing real. How did we start off? Something that may be coming down the pipeline that causes us to think it's going to be real. Fear makes us think that the worst is going to happen, or it holds up a magnifying glass to make things appear larger than they actually are, or they may be. Now that I don't have a problem with, identifying what the fear is in our life. But how do I deal with that fear? Knowing that fear, this false evidence appearing real, is not a God emotion. And we'll look at that here shortly. This is where I wrestle, friend. This is where I wrestle for, because fear is a huge part of our lives. We're, we're afraid, and I could list on and on, we're afraid of losing our job. We're, we're fear of, of, of our family relationships. We're fearful of our health situation we're probably in right now. We're, we're afraid of a financial situation, and, and we're fearful of uh, relationships with our spouse, or whatever it may be. I could go on and on and on. How we deal, how do we deal with this fear is what I'd like to look at this morning. Now, there's some sure physical ways that we deal with fear. Each one of us here this morning, we put a lock on our door. We put security cameras up. Or in the past, we've made longer lines of security at airports. Why? We're filled with fear. That the terrorists are going to strike. Here's another way we fight off fear. We buy it. We buy insurance plans. All this is partly due, now I'm not saying all these things are bad, don't get me wrong, but all of it is partly due to some fear in our lives, a fear of loss, a fear of pain, a fear of threat. And our, our, our plan is to keep this fear far from us, and if we can buy our way out of this fear, we'll hold it at check. We'll hold it at check. And so this morning as we get into this, it'd probably be wise for you and I, it don't take me long, in fact, I, even before I say it, to identify a few of those fears. And if you're like me, they boom, they pop up right in front of your face. One summer night during a severe thunderstorm, a lot of lightning and thunder going on. A mother tucked her little seven-year-old son into bed, and it was cracking outside. It was banging. And she was about to turn off the light, and her young son asked her with a fearful voice, he said, Mommy, will you, will you stay with me all night? And just like a loving mom, she smiled at him and said, gave him a big hug and said, I'd love to, honey, but I can't. I have to sleep in Daddy's room. And the boy was sad and had that fearful look on his face. And finally, after looking and thinking, he looked back at Mom with a shaky voice and said, That big sissy. <laughs> Here's the number one truth about fear. Number one truth. We always want to blame someone else. Or something else for our fear. This little boy, who did he blame? His dad. And his dad had nothing to do with his fear of the weather, of the storm, whether he was going to be safe. Now in Psalm 34 here this morning, David has just finished hiding from Saul. And, and he's, he's, what is he doing in these opening verses? He's praising God uh, it's, it's a teaching lesson for us here this morning. He's praising God and His attributes of keeping Him safe. Uh, praise of a situation or a person will help us gain a new perspective as well as understanding and praising God for His sovereignty that He's greater than the fear. We have to grasp that this morning. 
and we'll look at that a little bit. He's greater than the fear, and this will help us be lifted up of that pit of fear itself. Because here's the truth, and if you're going to write anything down this morning, write this. Sometimes the Lord calms the storms. And sometimes the Lord lets the storms rage. And He calms His child. Sometimes God calms the storm. But sometimes God lets the storm rage for our good, and we can't see that picture in the big picture, but He lets it rage, and He calms His child. And then we read in Psalm 34, and we come to those what I call pretty words. I sought the Lord in verse 4, and He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Is that possible? That God can deliver us from every fear? Congregation, I'm stumped here. I don't have an answer for that. David experienced that. That's all I can really tell you this morning. He was in a hiding place from Saul and no doubt filled with fear. But he says that God delivered him from all his fear. One of the most powerful ways of overcoming fears is what we have to look at here this morning. And one of the most top ten lists of getting past false evidence that appears real to you is this. If you've identified those fears that I've asked you in your life, you and I have to expose them. Well, that's hard to do. In fact, the first emotion in the beginning of the world that we come across in Genesis 3 in mankind is what? What do we read this morning? It's fear. It's fear. Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 are in the Garden of Eden. They have perfect harmony with God. Beautiful harmony with God. And God comes into the garden in the cool of the morning and it's a, it's a day in which they have uh, fallen into Satan's trap, Adam and Eve are, and God comes in and he says, where are you? And Adam, sheepishly hiding behind a bush, says, I'm over here, God. Why are you hiding, Adam? What's wrong? I'm naked. I'm afraid. I'm full of fear. Notice in Genesis 3 that God did not place the fear in Adam and Eve's life. Fear was formed by what? Fear was created in Adam and Eve's life by what? A few things, an act of sin. Another thing, a dependence on their own understanding, like, let's make this decision on our own. The third thing was a separation from God, and finally, a love for themselves off over, uh, over who God was in their life. Now, oftentimes, as we read Genesis 3 and Psalm 34, we read over it and we say, oh, this thing of fear, wow, this thing of being afraid. But you know what a brother and sister is to fear? Guilt. Shame. I'm feeling so guilty because of the false evidence that may appeal real to me right now. That I'm filled with shame and dirt. Adam was hiding because he was afraid. What's the first thing he was? He was shameful of his nakedness. You see, the more we try to hide or cover up our sins that weigh us down, the more we will try to hide from God. And, and all I can say is, the deeper we will go in the valley. Maybe you're saying this morning, thanks a lot, Brad, you just added to my fear rather than diminishing it. Uh, I would claim the largest mistake in fighting the wrestle of fear is that we try to deliver our own selves our, with our own power from the stronghold of our lives. 
And I probably get passionate about that because we think we can do that, and I think I can do that in my life. I can buy my way out of it. I can work my way out of it. I can, I can uh, wrestle my way out of it. You see, those who try to deny feelings of fear keep themselves out of touch with the experience of having to depend on Jesus Christ is what happens. In Simply in Congregation, there's too many people today who are carrying burdens that only God can take care of and He didn't intend for them to bear. What's fear like? I'd like to relate it to that warning light that comes on on your vehicle or that 1998 Chevy pickup, check engine soon. If you're like me, you're like, oh, there's that light again. Yeah, whatever. And it keeps blinking at us. We're like, yeah, I know. And we don't do nothing about it until finally what? Mechanically we break down. We ignore it until something happens. Fear can be like that warning light that is blinking, and oftentimes what do we do? Oh yeah, deny it. Ignore it. It'll go away. It'll go away on its own. But there's something we have to do. We can de not deny those feelings of fear. But we use it as a gauge in our life for putting on what? The full armor of God. And I want to read that from Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power put on the full armor of God that you can take stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle isn't against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. And then he tells us what to do. Put on the belt of truth, buckled around your waist, with the blessed breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Oftentimes I feel like fear begins in our lives because of the very fact we've let down our spiritual guard. And we've let Satan come in and give us some false evidence that starts appearing real. And we start believing it. And we let down our spiritual guard. Remember, though, in this pruning process that God never wastes a hurt, there is nothing that will steal your and my joy in our lives like unconfessed sin. Nothing, nothing. So what's the solution, Brad? What's the solution? What was Adam and Eve's love? themselves what was best for them what is your love when your fear for being laid off oh, our love for our finances and our love for our job what's your love when you fear your and I've been through this in my life that my addiction is being opened up to the public eye or the help of a counselor or what causes that fear? Whether for me, it was my love of that addiction. Whether it's gambling or pornography or drugs or alcohol. What is your love when you're fearing for maybe a relationship, like a marriage relationship? Status? Or stability? Here is the answer to fear this morning. Here is the answer to fear from 1 John 4, verse 8. And John here is talking about this whole realm of God's love becoming real in our lives. 
And he says in verse 18 of 1 John 4, there is no fear in love. Then he goes on to say, but perfect love drives out fear. Hold on to that sentence. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. According to 1 John 4, verse 8, none of the above, the fear of my job, the love of my job, the love of my relationship, the love of my, of my uh, um, marriage, the love of my addiction, none of them are true love. That is only found in a pursuit of Jesus Christ. And so like you and I, we're afraid of these dark valley experiences. But remember God's love through Jesus that can carry us because it is what? What does John say? <coughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. Perfect love casts out this garbage. Do you know if we were to put in a fishbowl fear and love? It would be like this. They cannot coexist. In fact, the closer you and I get to the true love of who Jesus Christ is, the further fear. But the same is true in the other direction as well. The closer we get to fear, the further our passion for Jesus Christ and our love for Him will fade. You see, once Jesus carries us through that valley of fear, there's a sad truth that what happens in our lives is we're quickly able to forget what God has just done. And what do we do? Let's pounce on the next fear that I'm going through. Instead of staying here a while and praising the one who delivered us. Maybe this morning you're holding on to a bondage of fear. But you've never forgiven yourself. It's probably one of the most talked things that I talk about with my counselor. Brad, you have to forgive yourself. That's hard. That's hard. I ran across a couple statistics last night that just rocked my world. Did you know that 77% of everything that we do, say, think about is negative and works against us? And I thought about that and I thought, I wonder if this is true. And it came from a, I don't know, a poll. And I thought, you know, you open the newspaper, I think it's right on. Here's another one that just, as my children are, Drew's leaving the house uh, this fall to go to college, and they're all out of the house. People who grow up in an average household, parents, people who grow up in an average household hear the word no, or are told you can't do that, more than 148,000 times. by the time they reach 18. And this is what I wrote down. Wow, moms and dads. Are we maybe culprits of sending our children out of the house already loaded with fear? Of what they can do or who they can't be in the eyes of Jesus Christ? In closing, I want to share with you this portion of Max Lucado's book, In the Eye of the Storm. If you know Max Lucado, he's a powerful writer and he's truly a godly man. He talks about uh, in his book that he was traveling from San Antonio to um, Boston. And then from Boston, he immediately had to board a plane to go to Edmonton, Edmonton Canada all in speaking engagements. And he was going from Boston to Canada, and he stopped in Minneapolis. That's where he had to change planes. 
and he said he was completely exhausted. The plane was full. He was sitting in a tight place. His back was aching. He was hungry. He started thinking about all those things, and he forgot who was going to pick him up in Canada. And as he was heading to his next gate, he seen a McDonald's, and he knew that if he went and ate a little something there, that that would fill that hunger void. And as he was walking past the McDonald's, or towards the McDonald's, he walked past a, a telephone, and so he stopped. And he picked up his telephone, and he called home. Max called his wife and talked to her and settled some small issues like the weather and how school was going for his daughters. And one of them was having a sleepover. They talked about that. And after he had talked to his wife, um, a lot of the fear about his next schedule was gone. And she handed the phone to one of his daughters. And Max says, she told me when she was finished, I love you, Dad. He said, that felt so good to be loved. And she passed the phone to the next daughter, and she told her dad how much she missed him. And Max Lucado said, it felt so good to be missed. And they passed the phone to his six-month-old daughter. And he said, I cooed and I talked baby talk with her. And it felt wonderful to hear her coo back. He says, then we hung up and I made it to my next gate. And Max recalled, I forgot how hungry I was. I forgot how tired I was. I forgot how bad my neck hurt. All because I called home. I made all the difference in the world. Max said, maybe our biggest issue is we don't call home. I think he's right on. If I, Brad Verink, would call God, would call home more often to the throne of God, these false evidence appearing in my life, becoming real, wouldn't be so evident. If we do, we will find a listening ear of Jesus so anxious to talk to us. And that perfect love will drown out our fear. I can recall praying for people or even, even having people pray for me who are loaded with fear and almost seeing the angels of God come down and pull it off them like scales and remove it. But you know what? They usually call back in a couple weeks and the fear's over. And what do we do? We call home. And again, God removes this false evidence that's appearing real. What do you fear? You know my greatest fear? If you ever sat at someone's bedside and they fear death. Because they fear if they don't know they don't know they're going to heaven. I pray that's not your fear this morning. If it is, call home. I love to put in there Jesus is anxiously. Sometimes we look at our phone and then we look at caller ID and it's like, oh, take that call. Yeah, what do you want? It's not Jesus. He's anxiously waiting for you to unload your fear. Father in heaven, I, I don't know if we've hit the fringes of how to deal with this fear thing in our lives, but just want to stake our thought process this morning that whatever we're fearing, your perfect love will drown out the fear. And I pray for those here this morning, Lord, who have real fears in their life. Fears of the unknown. Of 
something that they're sure is going to happen, then it's never been reality. Pray for those here this morning, Lord, who are afraid, who are afraid of starting a new business, afraid of starting a new relationship, afraid of a relationship they're in. Pray for those too, Lord, who are fearful of the next doctor appointment and what he will say. We could go on and on, Lord. We could sit here and share the things we are fearful, but Father, there's some of those fears we have hidden in the back corner of our heart. We haven't even exposed them to you. And we're walking like we got a 200-foot log chain tied to our back, and we're burdening through life because this fear is just weighing us down, and yet we don't want to expose it. Father, would you spring it loose this morning? Would people be able to go home or talk to someone or go on their bed and fall on their knees before you and say, God, I am so fearful of this. I need your perfect love to shower over me. And the beauty is, Lord, we believe you will do that. So, Lord, use this message any way you see fit. Keep fear far from us. And fill us with what David expressed, a joy in believing. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and confess your faith with me in the words of the Apostles' Creed? Let's say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We celebrate God's goodness with our morning offering.